Shalom, shalom, everybody. Shalom, everybody. Shallow here, man. We here with the last law of the 48 laws of power, man. I'm going to take me a quick little drink right quick while I give everybody just a second. Man, this is the last law. We almost made it through the whole book. <laughs> we at the end. We at the end. Law 48, assume formlessness. And when I first heard it, the first thing I thought of was Bruce Lee. First thing I thought of was Bruce Lee. So we're on the last book, man. I mean, the last law. Last law. And then it's on to Sister Sherazad Ali's next book. Um, the Black Woman's Guide to Understanding the Black Man, which I can't wait for. But until then. Let's go ahead and get this law 48. The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, the Joyce Elfer's book. Man, we went through a lot of stuff, man, a lot of stuff. Assume formlessness, hmm. judgment. By taking a shape, by having a visible, a visible plan, you open yourself to attack. Instead of taking a form for your enemy to grasp, keep yourself adaptable and on the move. Accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. The best way to protect yourself is to be as fluid and formless as water. Never be on, on stability or lasting order. Everything changes. Excuse me. Never bet on stability and lasting order. Everything changes. Transgression of the law. Let me make sure I got all my stuff where I can get to it. Pencil, pen, dictionary. You had to get some bandages. Bandages for my book. All right. Transgression of the law. By the 8th century BC, the city states of Greece had grown so large and prosperous that they had run out of the, out of the land to support their expanding populations. So they turned to the sea, establishing colonies in Asia Minor, Sicily, the Italian peninsula, even Africa. The city state of Sparta, however, was landlocked and surrounded by mountains. Lacking access to the Mediterranean, the Spartans never became a seafaring people. Instead, they turned on the cities around them. And in a series of brutal, violent conflicts lasting more than 100 years, managed to conquer an immense an immense area that will provide enough land for their citizens. This solution was uh, this solution to their problem, however, brought a new, more formidable one. How could they maintain and police their conquered territories? The subordinate people they ruled now outnumbered them 10 to 1. Surely this horde would take a horrible revenge on them. Sparta's solution was to create a society dedicated to the art of war. Sparta would be tougher, stronger, and fiercer than their neighbors. This was the only way they stood in a military club where he was trained to fight and under and underwork and excuse me and underwent the strictest discipline. I like the sound of that. Mm. I like the sound of that. When a Spartan, when a Spartan boy. Reached the age of seven, he was taken from his mother and placed in a military club where he was trained to fight and underwent the strictest discipline, outer garment to wear for the entire year. Hmm. They studied none of the arts. Indeed, the Spartans banned music and permitted only slaves to practice the crafts that were necessary to sustain them. The only skills the Spartans taught were those of warfare. I don't agree with that one. Children seen as weakness were left to die in a cavern in the mountains. <laughs> no system of money or trading was allowed in. Sparta acquired wealth they believed would so would so self selfishness. Sparta, I mean, uh, no system of, of money or trade was allowed in Sparta. Acquired wealth they believed would so selfishness and dissension. Winking, 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 
weakening their warrior discipline. The only way a Spartan could earn a living was through agriculture, mostly on state-owned lands, which slaves called helots would work for them. The Spartan single-mindedness allowed them to forge and most forged the most powerful infantry in the world. They marched in perfect order and fought with incomparable bravery. Their tight-knit phalanxes could vanquish an army 10 times their size as they proved in defeating the Persians at Thermopylae. The Spartan colony, the Spartan column on the march would strike towards, ah, man, what is up with you tonight? The Spartan column on the march would strike terror in the enemy. It seemed to have no weakness, yet although the Spartans proved themselves mighty warriors, they had no interest in creating an empire. They only wanted to keep what they had already conquered and to defend it acquired against invaders. Decades would pass without a single change in the system and had six, and had six, ah, decades would pass without a single change in the system that had succeeded so well in preserving Sparta's status quo. At the same time that the Spartans were evolving their warlike culture, another city-state was rising to equal prominence, Athens. Unlike Sparta, Athens had taken to the sea, not so much to create colonies as for purpose of trade. The Athenians became great merchants through currency. The famous owl coins spread throughout the Mediterranean. Unlike the richest Spartans, the Athenians responded to every problem with consummate creativity adapting to the occasion and creating new social forms new social forms and new arts at an incredible pace their society was a, a constant flux and as they as their power grew they came to pose a threat to the defense mind minded spartans in 431 bc the war that had been brewing between athens and sparta for so long finally erupted at last, 27 years, but after many twists and twists of fortunes, the Spartan war machine finally emerged victorious. The Spartans now commanded an empire, and this time they could not stay in their shell. If they gave up what they had gained, the beaten Athenians would regroup and rise against them, and the long war would have been fought for naught. After the war, Athenian money poured into Sparta. The Spartans had been trained in warfare, not politics or economics. Because they were so unaccustomed to it, wealth and its accompanying ways of life seduced and overwhelmed them. Spartan, Spartan governors were sent to rule what had been, been Athenian land, far from home. They succumbed to the worst forms of corruption. Sparta had defeated Athens, but the fluid Athenian way of life was slowly breaking down its discipline and loosening its rigid order. And Athens, meanwhile, was adapting to losing its empire, managing to thrive as a culture and economic center. Confused by a change in the status quo, Sparta grew weaker and weaker. Some 30 years after defeating Athens, it lost an important battle with the city-state of Thebes. Almost overnight, this once mighty nation collapsed, never to recover. <laughs> Interpretation. In the evolution of species, protective armor has almost always spelled disaster. Although there are few, although there are a few exceptions, the shell most often becomes the dead end for the animal encased in it. It slows more, more powerful and secure. In facing a serious problem, controlling superior numbers, Sparta reacted like an animal that, developed a sh that develops a shell to protect itself from the environment. But like a turtle, the Spartans sacrificed mobility for safety. They managed to preserve stability for 300 years, but at what cost? They had no culture behind warfare, beyond warfare. No arts to relieve the tension, a constant anxiety about the status quo. While their neighbors took to the sea, learning to adapt to a world of constant motion, the Spartans entombed themselves in their own system. Victory would, me would mean, excuse me, victory would mean new lands to govern, which they did not want. Defeat would mean the end of their military machine. They did not want that, excuse me, they, which they did not want either. Only stasis, 
allowed, allowed them to survive. But nothing in the world could remain stable forever. And the shell or system you evolve for the protection will someday prove your undoing. In the case of Sparta, it was not the armies of Athens that defeated it, but the Athenian money. Money flows everywhere it has the opportunity to go. It cannot be controlled or made to fit a prescribed pattern. It is inherently chaotic. In, and in the long run, money made uh, uh, Athens the conqueror by infiltrating the Spartan system of co and, co uh, and corroding its protective armor. In the battle between the two systems, Athens was fluid and creative enough to take new forms while Sparta could grow only more rigid until it fell disaster. People weighed down by a system and inflexible ways and inflexible ways of doing things cannot move fast, cannot sense or adapt to change. They lumber around more and more slowly until they go the way of the, of the brontosaurus. Learn to move fast and adapt or you will be eaten. The best way to avoid this fate is to assume formlessness. No predator alive can attack what it cannot see. Observance of the law. When World War II ended and the Japanese, who had invaded China in 1937, had finally been thrown out, the, J the Chinese nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Kai-shek, decided the time had come to annihilate the Chinese communists, their hated rivals, once and for all. They had almost succeeded in 1935, forcing the communists into a long march, the grueling retreat that had greatly diminished their numbers. Although the communists had recovered somewhat during the war against Japan, it would not be difficult to defeat them now. They controlled only isolated areas in the countryside, had unsophisticated weaponry, lacked any military express, uh, experience or training beyond mountain fighting, and controlled no important parts of China except areas, areas of Manchuria. Manchuria. Shane decided to commit the best, his best forces in the region, sweeping, sweeping the communists away. Once Manchuria had failed, the communists had fallen, the communists would collapse. In 1945 and 46, the nationalists easily took the major Manchurian cities. Uh, puzzling, though, in the face of this critical campaign, the communist strategy made no sense. When the nationalists began their push, the communists dispersed to Manchuria's most out-of-the-way corners. Their small units harassed the nationalist army, ambushing them here, ret uh, retreating unexpectedly there. But these dispersed units never linked up. harassed the nationalist armies, ambushing them here, retreating unexpectedly there. But, this, but these dispersed units never linked up, making them hard to attack. They would seize a town only to give it up a few weeks later. Forming neither rear guard nor vanguard, they moved like mercury, never staying in one place, elusive and formless. The nationalists ascribed this to two things cowardice in the face of a superior force and inexperience in strategy. Mao Zedong, the communist leader, was more a poet and philosopher than a general. Whereas Shang had studied warfare in the West and was a follower of the German military writer Karl von Klopswitz, among, among, among others. Yet a pattern did eventually emerge in Mao's attacks. After nationalists had taken the cities, leaving the communists to occupy what was generally considered Manchuria's useless space, the communists started using the large space to surround the cities. If Chang sent an army from one city to reinforce another, the communists would encircle the, re the rescuing army. Chang's forces were slowly broken into smaller and smaller units, isolating from one another. Their lines of supply and communication cut. The nationalists still had superior firepower, but if they could not move, what good was it? A kind of terror overcome the nationalist soldiers. Uh, commanders comfortably remote from the, front, from the front lines might laugh at Mao, but the soldiers had fought the communists in the mountains and had come to fear their, fear their elusiveness. Now these soldiers sat on their cities, 
and watched as they as their fast moving enemies, as fluid as water, poured in on them from all sides. There seemed to be millions of them. The communists also encircled the soldiers, the soldier spirits, bombarding them with propaganda to lower the, their morale and pressure them to desert. The nationalists began to surrender in their minds. They their encircled and isolated city started collapsing even before being directed, directly attacked. One after another fell in quick succession. In November of 1984, the nationalists surrounded Manchuria to the uh, surrendered Manchuria to the communists, a humiliating blow to the technically superior nationalist army and, and one that proved decisive in war. By the following year, the communist board games that best uh, approximate the strategies of war are chess, chess and the Asian game of Go. In chess, the board is small. In comparison to Go, the attack comes relatively quickly, forcing a decisive battle. It rarely pays to withdraw or to sacrifice your pieces, much, much uh, which must be con concentrated at key areas. Go is, is, much, is much less formal. It is played on a large grid with 361 intersections, ne nearly six times as many positions as in chess. Black and white stones, one color for each side, are placed on the board's intersection by circling them. A game of go hmm. trying to wait for there we go. I'm gonna go back to it because I want to read that again. The two board games that best approximate the strategies of war are chess and the Asian game of go. In chess, the board is small in comparison to go. The attack comes relatively quickly, forcing a decisive battle. It rarely pays to withdraw or to sacrifice your pieces, which must be concentrated at key areas. Go, go is a much less go is much less formal. It is played on a large grid with 361 intersections, nearly six times as many positions as in chess. Black and white stones, one color for each side, are placed on the board's intersections one at a time, wherever you like. Once all the stones, 52 of each for each side are on the board, the object is to isolate the stones of your opponent by encircling them. A game of go called Wei Qi in China can last up to 300 moves. The strategy is more subtle and fluid than chess. Developing slowly, the more complex the pattern your stones initially create on the board, the harder it is for your opponent to understand your strategy. Fighting to control a, power, a particular area is not worth the trouble. You have to think, think in larger terms. To be prepared to sacrifice an area in order eventually to dominate the board. What you are after is not an entrenched position, but mobility. The, with mobility, you can isolate the opponent in small areas and then encircle them. The aim is not to kill off the opponent's pieces directly as in chess, but to induce a kind of paralysis and collapse. Chinese, I mean, my bad, chess is linear, position-oriented, and aggressive. Go is go. <laughs> go is nonlinear and fluid. Aggression is is indirect until the end of the game. Aggression is indirect until the end of the game. When the winners can surround the opponent's stones at an, at an accelerated pace, Chinese military strategies have been influenced by gold for centuries. In, proverb, in Proverbs, its proverbs have been applied to war time and again. Mao Zedong was, was an addict of Wei Xi, and its precepts were ingrained in his strategies. A key Wei Xi, Wei, Qi, Wei Qi concept, for example, is to use the size of the board to your advantage, spreading out in, spreading out in every direction so that the opponent cannot fathom your, your movements in a simple linear way. Every Chinese, Mao once wrote, 
should consciously throw himself into this war of jigsaw of a jigsaw pattern against the nationalists. Place your men on the jigsaw pattern on go, and your opponent loses himself trying to figure out what you are up to. Either he wastes time pursuing you, or like like Shen Shen Kai Shek, he assumes you are incompetent and fails to protect himself. And if he concentrates on single areas, as Western strategy advises, he becomes a, a sitting duck for encirclement. In the Wei Shi Wei of war, you encircle the enemy's brain using mind games, propaganda, and irritation tactics to confuse and dishearten. This was a strategy of the communists, an, an apparent formlessness that disorientated and terrified the enemy. Where chess is linear and direct, the ancient game of Go is closer to the kind of strategy that will prove relevant in a world where battles are fought indirectly in vast, loosely connected areas. Its strategies are abstract and multidimensional, inha inhabiting a plane, a plane behind time and space, the strategist mind. In this fluid form of warfare, you value, you, you value movement over position. Your speed and the mobility make it impossible to predict your moves, unable to understand you. Your enemy can form no strategy to defeat you. Instead of fixing, Chinese game of go. Chinese game of go. According to Wikipedia, go or wakey. Waichi is an abstract strategy board game for two players in which the aim is to surround more territory than the opponent. Hmm. Go. Find a picture of go. We are like go go table. All right, favorite first. Now, whoever want to try to play with me, let me know. <laughs> I might have to see what's up, man. Somebody got to tease me. Go. Go, huh? Your speed and mobility make it impossible to predict your moves. Unable to understand you, your enemy can form no strategy to defeat you. Instead of fixing on particular spots, this indirect form of warfare spreads out, just as you can use the large and dis disconnected nature of the real world to your advantage. Be like a viper, but uh, do not give your opponents anything solid to attack. Watch as they exhaust themselves pursuing you, trying to cope with your elusiveness. Only formlessness allows you to truly surprise your enemies. By the time they figure out where you are and what you are up to, it's too late. When you want to fight us, we don't let you. You can't find us. But when you want to, but when we want to fight you, we make sure that you can't get away, and we hit you squarely and wipe you out. The enemy advances. We retreat. The enemy camps. We harass. The enemy tires. We attack. The enemies retreat. We pursue. Mao Zedong, 1893-1967. I like I'm 1976. My bad. 1893 to 1976. Man, I like all that. <laughs> that boy Mao Zedong. Talking that shit, man. When we, when you want to fight us, we don't let you, and you can't find us. But when we want to fight you, <laughs> we make sure that you can't get away, and we hit you squarely and wipe you out. The enemy advances, we retreat. The enemy camps, we harass. The enemy tires, we attack. The enemies retreat, we pursue. Mao Zedong, 1893 to 
to 17, I mean, to 1976. Damn, that ball was on this thing. I like that. Keys to power. We cannot communicate our emotions without a form. The form that we create, however, change, change consistently. The forms that we create, however, change consistently in fashion, in style, in all those human phenomena representing the mood of the moment. We are constantly altering the forms we have inherited from previous generations. And these changes are signs of life and vitality. Indeed, the things that don't change, the forms that rigidify, come to look to us like death, and we destroy them. The young show, show this most clearly, uncomfortable with the forms that society imposes upon them. Having no set identity, they play with their own characters, trying on a, trying on a variety of masks and poses to express themselves. This is the vitality that drives the motor of form, creating constant changes in life. The powerful are often people who in their youth have shown immense creativity in expressing, in expressing something new through a new form. Society grants them power because it's because it can feel, and their rigidity makes them easy targets. Everyone knows their next move. Instead of demanding respect, they elicit boredom. Get off the stage, we say. <laughs> Let someone else, someone younger, entertain us. We locked, when locked in the past, the powerful look comical. They are overripe for you, waiting to fall from the tree. Hmm. When locked in the past, the powerful look comical. They are overripe fruit, waiting to fall from the tree. Power can only thrive if it is flexible in its forms. To be formless is not to be. Uh, amorphous. Let's see. Amorphous. 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 Something to do with change. Something to do with changing. A M O R P H O U S. Amorph. Amorphous. Amorphous, formless. Amorphous means formless. Power can only thrive if it is flexible in its forms. To be formless is not to be formless. <laughs> Let me go back to the make sure. Yeah. To be formless is not to be formless or amorphous. Everything has form. It is impossible to avoid. The formlessness of power is more like that of water or mercury, taking the form of whatever it is around it, changing constantly. It is never predictable. The, rap the rapidity, the, excuse me, it is never predictable. The power, the powerful are constantly creating form, and their power comes from the rapidity uh, the rapidity, the rap, the rapidity, rapid, rapidity, with which they can change. Their formlessness is an eye of the enemy who cannot see what they are up to, and so his, and so has nothing solid to attack. This is the premier pose of power, ungraspable, as elusive and swift as the god Mercury, who could take on any form who could take any form he pleased and use this ability to wreak havoc on Mount Olympus. On Mount Olympus. Human creations evolve towards abstraction, toward being more mental and less material. This evolution is clear in art, which in this, in this century made the great discovery of abstraction and conceptualism. It can also be seen in politics, which over time have become less overtly violent, more, more, com, uh, more complicated, indirect, and cerebral. Warfare and strategy, too, have followed this pattern. Strategy began in the, manipula in the manipulation of armies on land, positioning them in order formations. On land, strategy is relatively two-dimensional and controlled by topography. 
but all the great powers have eventually taken to the sea for, for commerce and civilization, excuse me, for commerce and colonization. And to protect their trading lines, they have had to learn how to fight at sea. Maritime warfare requires tremendous creativity and abstract thinking. Since the lines are constantly shifting, naval captains distinguish themselves by their ability to adapt to the literal fluidity of the terrain and to confuse the enemy of, with, with an abstract, hard to anticipate form. They are operating in a third dimension, the mind. Back on land, Guerrilla warfare too demonstrates this evolution towards abstraction. T.E. Lawrence was perhaps the first modern strategist to develop the theory behind this kind of warfare and to put it into practice. His ideas influenced Mao, who found in his writings an uncanny Western equivalent to Wei Xi. Lawrence was working with, Ar with Arabs or Arabs <laughs> fighting for their territory against the Turks. His idea was to make the Arabs blend into the vast desert, never providing a target, never collecting, to, never collecting together in one place. Remind me of Iraq. Remind me of Iraq right now, baby. His idea was to make the Arabs blend into the vast desert never providing a target, never collecting together in one place. As the Turks scrambled to fight this vaporous, this, uh, yeah, vaporous army, they spread themselves, they spread themselves thin, wasting energy and moving from place to place. They had, a, they had the superior firepower, but the Arabs kept the initiative by playing cat and mouse giving the Turks nothing to hold on to, destroying their morale. Most wars are most wars were wars of contact. Ours should be a war of detachment, Lawrence wrote. We were to contain the enemy by the silent threat of vast unknown deserts, nor not disclosing ourselves till we attack. This is the ultimate form of strategy. The war of engagement has become far too dangerous and costly. Indirection and uh, elusiveness yield far better results at a much lower cost. The main cost, in fact, is mental. The thinking it takes uh, to align your forces in scattered patterns and to undermine the minds and psycho psych psych psychology of your opponents. And nothing will infiltrate and disorient them more than formlessness. In a world where wars are detachment, wars of detachment, or the order of the day, formlessness is crucial. The first psychological requirement of formlessness is to train yourself to take nothing personally. The first psycho psychological requirement of formlessness is to train yourself to take nothing personally. Never show any defensiveness. When you act defensive, you show your emotions, revealing a clear form. Your opponents will realize they have hit a nerve, an Achilles heel, and they will hit it again and again. So train yourself to take nothing personally. Never let anyone get your back, get your back up. Never let anyone get your back up. Be like a slippery ball that cannot be held. Let no one know what gets to you or where your weakness lie or weaknesses lie. Make your face as for a formless mask and you will infuriate and disorient your scheming colleagues and opponents. I guess that's your, uh, uh, your poker face, huh? One man who used this technique was Baron, John, Baron James Rothschild, a German Jew in Paris. In a culture decided this, uh, in a culture decidedly unfriendly to foreigners, Rothschild never took any attacks on him personally, and showed he had been hurt in any way. He furthermore adapted himself to the political climate, whatever it was. 
the stifling formal restoration monarchy of, of Louis the 18th. The board, the board, uh, the Borges reign of Louis of Louis Philippe, the Democratic Revolution of 1848, the upstart Louis uh, Louis Napoleon, crown emperor in 1852. Rothschild accepted them one and all and blended in. He could afford to appear hypocritical or op opportunistic because he was valued for his money, not his politics. His money was a currency of power. Still live. While he adapted and thrived, outwardly never showing a form, all the other great families that had begun the centuries immensely, immensely wealthy were ruined in the period's complicated shifts and turns of fortune. Attaching themselves to the past, they revealed their embrace of a form. Throughout history, the formless style of ruling has been most adaptable, most adeptly practiced by the queen who reigns alone. A queen? Hmm. Oh man. Oh man. Let me mark this one another color. Another color. Throughout history. The formless style of ruling has been most adeptly practiced by the queen who reigns alone, the independent woman. Hmm. The independent woman. A queen. Hey, don't they have a lot of them calling themselves that today? The queen that reigns alone. Hmm. A queen is in a radically different position from a king. Because she is a woman, her subjects and courtiers are likely to doubt her ability to rule, her strength of character. If she favors one side in some ideological struggle, she is said to be acting out of emotional attachment. Yet if she represses her, her emotions and plays the authoritarian in the male fashion, she arouses worse criticism still, either by nature or by experience. I need to mark all that. Either by nature or by experience, then, Queens tend to adopt a flexible style of governing that in the end often proves more powerful than the more direct male form. Two female leaders exemplifying the formless styles of rule are Queen Elizabeth of England and Empress Catherine of Great, uh, the Great of Russia. In the violent wars between Catholics and Protestants, Elizabeth stirred, steered a middle course. She avoided alliances that would commit her to one side and that over time would harm the country. She managed to keep her, her ah, she managed to keep her country at pace until it was strong enough for war. Her reign was one of the most glorious in history because of her incredible capacity to adapt and her flexible ideology. Catherine the Great to evolve an impoverishing um ah, in, in Improvisatory. Catherine the Great too evolved an impro improvisatory style of governing. After she de deposed her husband, she deposed him. I wonder. I wonder what's that about? How can you depose? Was he the king? Can you depose a king? Can the queen depose a king? That's the question. After she deposed her husband, put a question mark right there. What does that mean? After she deposed her husband, Emperor Peter II, taking sole control of Russia in 1762, no one thought she would survive, but she had she had no preconceived ideas, no philosophy or theory to dictate her policies. Although a foreigner, she came from Germany. She understood Russia's moods and how it was changing over the years. 
one must govern in such a way that one's people think they themselves what want to do, uh, what one commands them to do, she said. And to do this, she had to be always a step ahead of their desires and to adapt to their resistance. By never forcing the issue, she reformed Russia in a strikingly short period of time. This feminine, formless style of ruling may have emerged as a way of, pros of prospering under difficult circumstances, but it has proved immensely seductive to those who have served under it. Being fluid, it is relatively easy for its subjects to abate, for they feel less coerced, less bent to their ruler's ideology. It also opens up options where an adherence to a doctrine closes them off. Without committing to one side, it, all, it allows the ruler to play one enemy uh, uh, off another. Rigid rulers may seem strong, but with time, their inflexibility wears on the nerves and their subjects find ways to push them from the stage. Flexible, formless rulers will be much criticized but they will endure and people will eventually come to identify with them since they are since they are as their subjects are change with the wind open to circumstance a coup huh? let, me mark, let me put that down supposing a coup Definitely better understood, Devin. Definitely better understood. Despite upsets and delays, the permeable style of power generally triumphs in the end, just as Athens eventually won, won victory over Sparta through its money and its culture. When you find yourselves in conflict with someone stronger and more rigid, allow them a momentary victory. Seem to bow to their superiority. Then, by being formless and adaptable, slowly insinuate with yourself into their soul. This way, you will catch them off guard. For rigid people are always ready to ward off direct blows, but are helpless against the subtle and insinuating. To succeed at such a strategy, you must play the chameleon. Conform on the surface while breaking down your enemy from the inside. For centuries, the Japanese would accept foreigners graciously and appeared susceptible, susceptible, susceptible to foreign cultures and influences. Uh, I'm not pronouncing his first name. Joe, Joe Rodriguez, a Portuguese priest who arrived in Japan in 1575, I mean 1577, and lived there for many years, wrote. I am flabbergasted by the Japanese willingness to try and accept everything Portuguese. He saw Japanese in the streets wearing Portuguese clothing with rosary beads at their necks and crosses at their hips. This might seem like a weak, uh, mutable culture, but, Jap uh, but Japan's adaptability actually protected the country from having any uh, an alien culture imposed imposed by military invasion. It seduced the Portuguese and other Westerners into believing the Japanese were yielding to a superior culture when actually the foreigners' cultures were way the foreigners' cultures, the foreign cultures ways were merely a fashion to be doned and doffed. Doned and doffed. Huh? Doned and doffed. Doned and doffed. D O N N E D and D O F F E D. Doned and doffed. All right, we got Dolph. To take off one's hat in salutation. 
itself. Let's see down here. Don't let it but doff is to take off one's hat. Huh? It seduced the Portuguese and other Westerners into believing the Japanese were yielding to a superior culture, when actually the foreign the, the foreign culture's ways were merely a fashion to be doned and doffed. Under the surface, Japanese culture thrived. Had the Japanese been rigid about foreign influences and tried to fight them off, they might have suffered the injuries that the West that the West inflicted on China. That is the power of formlessness. It gives the aggressor nothing to react against, nothing to hit. In evolution, largeness is often the first step towards extinction. What is immense and bloated has no mobility but must constantly feed itself. The intelligent are often seduced into believing that size connotes power. The bigger, the better. In 483 BC, King Xerxes of Persia invaded Greece, believing he could conquer the country in one easy campaign. After all, he had the largest army ever assembled for one of invasion. The historian Herodotus estimated it at over more than five million. Hmm. The Persians planned to build a bridge across the Hellespont to overrun Greece from the land, while their equally immense navy would pin the Greek ships in harbor, preventing their forces from escaping to sea. I wonder if this is all 300 I'm reading right here. That's what it's sounding like. Like I've been reading 300. <laughs> the backdrop, 300. The plan seemed sure, yet as Xerxes prepared the invasion, his advisor Arbit, uh, Artabanus warned his master of grave misgivings. La uh, the two mightiest powers in the world are against you, he said. Xerxes laughed. What powers could match his gigantic army? I will tell you what they are, answered Art Artabanus. Artabanus the land and the sea. They were no safe harbors large enough to receive Xerxes' fleet. And the more land the Persians conquered, the larger, the larger their supply lines stretched, the more ruinous the, count, the cost of feeding this immense army would prove. Thinking his advisor were a coward, Xerxes proceeded with the invasion. Yet, as Artabanus predicted, bad weather at sea disseminated the Persian fleet. Hmm. That is the one. Which was too large to take shelter in any harbor. On land, meanwhile, the Persian army destroyed everything in its past, which only made it impossible to feed, since the destruction in included crops and stores of food. It was also an easy and slow moving target. The Greeks practiced all kinds of deceptive maneuvers to disorient the, disorient the Persians. Xerxes eventually defeated at the hands of the Greek allies was an immense disaster. The story is emblematic. The story is emblematic of all those who sacrifice mobility for size. The flexibility and fleet of flute will always, will almost always win, for they have more strategic options. The more gigantic the enemy, the easier it is to induce collapse. The need for formlessness becomes greater the older you get. As we grow, more likely to become set in our ways and assume to rigid a form. We become predictable. Always the sight, the first sign of mm, decrepitude. And predictability makes us appear comical. 
although uh, although ridicule and disdain might seem mild forms of attack, they are actually potent weapons and will eventually erode a foundation of power. An enemy who does not rep respect you will grow bold. Hmm. Huh. An enemy who does not respect you will grow bold, and boldness makes even the most, the smallest animal dangerous. The late 18th century court of France, as exemplified by Marie Antoinette, had become as, uh, so hopelessly tied to a rigid formality that the average Frenchman thought it a silly relic. This, 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 this depreciation for a centuries old institution was the first sign of a terminal, terminal disease. For it represented a symbolic loosening of the people's ties to monarchy. As the situation worsened, Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI grew only more rigid in their adherence to the past and quickened their path to the guillotine. King Charles I of England reacted similarly, I mean, similarly to the tide of democratic change, brewing uh, brewing in England in the 1630s. He disbanded Parliament and his court rituals grew increasingly formal and distant. He wanted to return to an older style of rule with an adherence to all kinds of petty protocol. His rigidity only heightened the desire for change. Soon, of course, he was swept up in devastating civil war and eventually he lost his head to an executor's axe. As you get older, you must rely even less on the past. Be vigilant lest the form your character has be vigilant lest the form your character has taken makes you seem a relic. It is not a matter of mimicking the fashions of youth that is equally worth of uh, that is equally worth of laughter. Rather, your mind must constantly adapt to each circumstance, even the inevitable change that the time has come to move over and let those of younger younger age prepare for the, the ascendance. Rigidity will only make you look uncannily like a cadaver. <laughs> Never forget, though that formlessness is a strategic pose, it gives you room to create tactical surprises. As your enemies struggle to guess your next move, they, re they reveal their own strategy. Putting them, putting them at the decided, putting them at a decided disadvantage. It keeps the the initiative on your side, putting your enemies in the position of never acting, constantly reacting. It foils their spying and intelligence. Remember, formlessness is a tool. Never confuse it with a go for go with the flow style, or with a religious res re resignation to the twist of fortune. You use formlessness, not because it creates inner harmony and peace, but because it will increase your power. Finally, learning to adapt to each new, new circumstance means seeing events through your own eyes and often ignoring the advice that other people constantly peddle your way. It means that ultimately you must throw out the laws that, that, that others and the sage advice of the elder. The laws that govern circumstances are abolished by new circumstances. Napoleon wrote, which means that it is up to you to gauge each new situation. Rely too much on other people's ideas and you end up taking a form not of your own making. To much respect for other people's wisdom too much respect for other people's wisdom will make you depreciate your own. Be brutal with the past, especially your own, and have no respect for the philosophies that are fostered on you from outside. Image, Mercury, the winged messenger god of commerce, patron saint of thieves, gamblers, and all those who deceive through swiftness. The day Mercury was born, he invented the liar. By, by, by that evening, he had stolen the cattle of Apollo. 
he would scour the world, assuming whatever form he desired. Like the liquid metal named after him, he embodies the elusive and ungraspable, the power of formlessness, authority. Therefore, the consummation of forming an army is to arrive at formlessness. Victory in war is not repetuous, uh, but adapts its forms endlessly. A military force has no constant formation. Water has no constant shape. The ability to gain victory by changing and adapting according to an opponent is called genius. Sanzu, 4th century BC. The reversal. Using space to disperse and create an abstract pattern should not mean forsaking the concentration of your power when it is valuable to you. Formlessness makes your enemy hunt all over for you, scattering their own, their own forces, mental as well as physical. When you finally engage them, uh, excuse me, when you finally engage them, though, hit them with a powerful concentrated blow. That is how Mao succeeded against the nationalists. He broke their forces into small isolated units, which then, which he then could easily overwhelm with a strong attack. The law of concentration prevailed. When you play with formlessness, keep on top of the process and keep your long-term strategy in mind. When you assume a form and go on the attack, use concentration, speed, and power, as Mao said. When we fight you, we make sure that you can't get away. That was law 48 of the 48 laws of power. We are done with this book, man. I hope, uh, assume formlessness, law 48, assume formlessness, judgment. By taking a shape, by having a visible plan, you open yourself to attack. Instead of taking a form for your enemy to grasp, keep yourself adaptable and on the move. Accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. The best way to protect yourself is to be as fluid and formless as water. Never bet on the stability or lasting order. Never, it's my bad. Never bet on stability or lasting order. Everything changes. That was law 48, man. Law 48, the 48 laws of power. We have finished the book, man. We have finished the book. I hope everybody learned something. Uh, for everybody on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. Man, if there's any other books that you wanna hear, uh, uh, man, leave it in the comments, man. Send me a, a message on Facebook uh, uh, if it's a book that you wanna hear. And I'll try to see if I can accommodate that. Um, but the next book on the list is going to be Miss Sherazad Ali's uh, book, The Black Woman's Guide to Understanding the Black Man, uh, which I think is going to be a great one. I think that one's going to be a great one. So we'll start that one tomorrow. We will start that one tomorrow. Uh, but man, man, for everybody who rock women at night, man, that was a long one for me. Thank you. Shallow, shallow in here. And we'll be here. We'll keep, we'll keep learning and growing. Uh, uh, we'll get the meal and pick the meat off the bones. We're going to pick the meat off the bones and hold fast to that which is good. <laughs> hold fast to that which is good. You know, and we're going to rock with that. And we're going to rock with that. And we're going to learn and we're going to grow. But, you know, that's it for tonight, man. Thank y'all for sticking with me. Shalom. Shallow out.